All right, good evening and welcome to the March 7th Board of Education meeting. If everyone could join me with a pledge to the flag. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we will start this evening with the report of the superintendent, Dr. Byrne. Thank you very much. Good evening and thank you for joining us for our March 7th Board of Education meeting. Thank you to those members of the community who just joined us for our school board service informational meeting. While I've never been an elected board member, I've known quite a few over the years and I've often heard them talk about how rewarding school board service is. I hope everyone had a wonderful relaxing winter break, followed shortly thereafter by our first snow day in quite some time. If you recall, last year's singular snow day was actually an icy road day, so not very satisfying for those who enjoy snow events. This year we had snow of the best of the type best used for constructing snow people and snowballs. As a result of the snow day, we will now have school on Tuesday, May 30th. There are two additional snow emergency days remaining, May 26th and April 10th. Should we have another weather or emergency event, the next day we, we would take back would be May 26th, followed by April 10th, should there be a third snow or emergency day. This afternoon, I returned from Albany, where I, along with superintendents from across the state, spent yesterday and today focused on advocacy efforts specific to the state budget and potential legislative actions. Additionally, last Tuesday, on our snow day, I spent the day in virtual meetings with elected officials from our region, along with superintendents and school board members as part of the Lower Hudson Education Coalition, of which we're a member, uh, as part of the lobby day. Uh, it was supposed to be in person, but with the weather, uh, it was switched to virtual. And we spoke at length with our elected officials throughout the course of the day about the state budget and the needs of school districts. Um, one of the participants is our former Board of Education trustee and former Vice President President Karen Belanger, who is a member of the LHEC coalition. And tonight we are continuing our deep dive into specific areas of the 2023-2024 school year district budget of interest to the public. We heard about curriculum and special education on February 14th. Tonight we'll learn about technology, athletics, and facilities uh, from our directors. And for those members of the public who want to get the elevator speech on seven areas of the uh, budget, I encourage you to join us for our annual Community Budget Cafe coming up next Saturday, March 18th from 9.30 to 11 a.m. right here in the Middle School Multipurpose Room. We'll have administrators present, present and there will be individual tables set up where you can learn more about staffing and professional learning, the elementary, middle, and high schools, technology, pupil personnel services and special education, athletics, as well as operations and maintenance. We hope to see many of the members, many, many members of the community then. And that concludes my report for this evening. Okay, thank you. I know the snow day was much appreciated at my house, but um, I would also appreciate no more snow days. So <laughs> that's just one person's opinion, however. So moving on, we will begin our presentation and discussion. We will begin with our technology. technology. Dr. Sasson. All right, good evening everyone. Today I'm gonna to go through some highlights of what the technology department has been working on for this school year and then also give you some updates in terms of what our plans and our goals for next year are. Whenever we're thinking about our technology budget within the Rye City School District, we're always thinking about the three tenets of the Rye commitment. We wanna make sure that technology is impactful, it's meaningful, we're providing um, great communication, collaboration, and great um, learning experiences for all of our students. So that's constantly in the back of our mind as we are working through the department, planning and designing and developing. I'm gonna bring you through a roadmap today of different areas that we've been working on as a department. Please know that I'm up here presenting, but it's not an individual task. I have to thank my department, 
Our two instructional coaches, um, Ms. Persad and Ms. Del Judas, our data specialist, Megan Labella, and our um, engineers from Edutech. Without them, we couldn't do any of this. So you're gonna look up at the top. We're gonna start with our district infrastructure and security, and I'm gonna give you an overview of things that we've done this last year, which then leads into the goals and the future planning for next. We're gonna talk about instructional technology and professional learning and how that all ties it together. We're gonna to talk a little bit about some of the capital design projects. I won't tell you too much. I don't wanna steal Rob's presentation, um, but it's great to have a partner in this work. We're gonna look at data and communications because we have some of the exciting news and updates around that area, our technology committee, and then again, the goals for the next school year. So when we think about infrastructure and security highlights within Rye City, this is one of the um, biggest backbones of the district. Without a good, solid, robust infrastructure, anything else that I'm gonna talk about instructional-wise with our students, with our staff, is not possible. So with our five-year plan and working with Edutech, every year we grow in this area. You'll see we have four out of our five schools up here because Osborne Elementary School from last year with some of the highlights that we talked about, that work was previously done. Some of the biggest infrastructure work that we did, and there are just bullets up on this screen, but the amount of time and effort it took to do these was tremendous. We replaced switches, batteries, access points, um, increased our Wi-Fi. We worked on relocating server closets and racks. We've upgraded AV equipment in media centers in the new gray boxes or the halls of the auditoriums, depending on what you want to call them. Um, and we spent a lot of time looking at the robust infrastructure for security. Um, security has been a big focus for us, working with our operations team and making sure that we are securing all of our doors with our SALTO locks, we're upgrading our PA systems, and then also implementing a robust system with our new lockdown protocols that attach to the phone, that attach to the PA, and uh, alerts and um, different notifications are sent out to all administrators. God forbid there is an emergency and we have to um, you know, proceed with some protocols. So all of this has been really important. We're looking at efficiencies. We're looking at ways that systems can talk together. We're looking at effective communication so everyone is notified first moment. Um, and so through all of these things, we were able to put a lot of these systems in place. Some of them were still working out. Um, so as you can see on the screen, Osborne Elementary School was our first school that went with the PA upgrade. The other schools are being planned for the following years, and you'll see that in some of the goals for the 23-24 school year. Um, but it takes time. So we've spent about a, a year or so planning it, designing it, implementing it, testing it, and now um, we'll be ready to actually turn onto that system fully in the next several weeks. And then, as I said, start implementing and planning moving forward. So there's a lot of thoughtful process in what we're doing around this work. In regards to instructional technology, um, so we'd say, our kids say when all the fun stuff is, we're continuing to work on our mobile devices, K-12. Um, we constantly are looking to upgrade, making sure that our devices are new, refreshed, and robust for our students. Um, in the middle school, we do have a one-to-one -one program for our students in grades six through eight, but in addition to our students having access to our Chromebooks, we've also spent a lot of time um, increasing the amount of mobile technology in our engineering classrooms. The style of software that students need, it's called Revit for the designing uh, process, the engineering, the architect piece of it is really impactful. So making sure that we have the tools that they need to see the system in, in its entirety. Um, we continue to provide for all of our families. So providing a digital equity survey that goes out in the beginning of the year gives us a lot of good information in terms of what families do need support with technology. Um, so we still have hotspots and we have mobile devices available for our loan program for anyone that does reach out to us that is available. And loaning can be whether it's a weak need for an outage or it's a period of time so we're able to support those families that do come to us with that area. In regards to our faculty devices, um, we're excited to say that we've completed our phase two of our Microsoft Surface um, project. So this started two years ago with the task of the technology committee after getting out of the pandemic and our teachers um, working in remote learning with Chromebooks, we realized that we needed a more robust um, supported instructional tool for them to do the teaching and learning that we want and with the technology tools that are available. So two years ago, the team spent time investigating different um, hardwares, piloting them, getting feedback from teachers, and then finally making a decision. 
um, because the monies that were associated with this project, we realized that it needed to be a year two phase approach. So year one was our secondary um, teachers. And then year two, which we've just finished now, is all of our elementary. So we're really excited to say that the devices are working well. Um, and later on, I'll talk a little bit about how those devices are even gonna be helpful and impactful with some of the new interactive boards that we're putting in the classrooms. For software and our interactive TVs, we continue to vet all of our uh, web-based applications. So we use EdLaw2D as our framework to make sure that our personal identifiable information in the district is protected. Um, and we also use that as a guide for us and our teachers to make sure any tools that we are using are appropriate. So they're meaningful. We're not just using technology for the sake of it, that it's impactful, it's gonna enhance instruction, it's going to grow it, and students are gonna find it to be very meaningful in their work. Um, so we do, our staff developers, our coaches are great with this in terms of keeping up a document that our teachers can constantly refer to to make sure that depending on what the area of need is, they have a tool to support that learning and that work. Um, recently, we've just uh, deployed our Uniflow software. So this is new software for our, the district that's attached to our Canon copy machines. So now with a swipe of your ID card, you can print to any machine within the district, which is great. Um, it covers a couple of things for us. One is better access for uh, faculty and staff because now they can print from any machine that they're out and then go pick up the print at any time. We don't have things sitting at copiers. Um, it's more secure. So we're really excited that this was implemented in, across all of our schools. And then for the interactive Promethean boards, I can't thank the Ride Fund for Education enough. Um, it has been such a huge, um, it's amazing to see and to watch instead of having our outdated smart boards that don't work, don't align, and you can't write on them. Or you try to do a math problem and do your X and Y access and it doesn't exactly look like a straight line. Um, these have been incredible. And so with the help of Rob and his team and our maintenance department getting these up you know, as fast as we can, and I'll talk a little bit about what the professional learning looks like around them, this has been really impactful for our teachers. And then with all of these, just with support, continuing to provide three help desks within the district. So we have our faculty and staff help desk, we have our student help desk 612, and then also our parent guardian. And so that's something we haven't moved away from since the pandemic. Our parents still need support, our community has questions, and it's just a great avenue for them to be able to put in a ticket, and then within a very short period of time, get a response or someone to provide support in whatever the area it is that they need. So with all of the stuff, because that's all the stuff that we purchase, what do we do with it? And so our coaches are instrumental in the professional learning piece. Um, one of our biggest goals and mottos in the department is we don't just buy stuff for the sake of buying it. There's always a thought process around how are we going to provide professional learning so we can understand the tool, the impactfulness, and how it's going to grow us as all learners. So as coaches, the biggest thing that we work on as a PD team and as a department is the planning, modeling, and coaching. So our two staff developers along with our other staff developers are constantly doing one-to-one um, -one instruction with teachers. They may be pulling small groups. They may be working in department meetings. Um, and then all of the tremendous before and after school in-service courses that they run. Some of the courses are listed on the side. I did not put all of them. Dr. Burns said my slides had to be short, so I try to follow suit. Um, but these are just some of the courses that we've recently taught um, and it's great to co-teach them with them. To be with teachers, to learn and to grow together has been really helpful. So topics around active learning boot camp with Promethean boards, again, because we're not just putting the boards in the classroom, we want to provide the learning around it. Um, redesigning learning environments has been really big. Now that we're back in district, we're really starting to have those conversations again about getting up and moving and being active and shifting the mindset of a classroom. So that's been uh, great work to lead. Um, providing accessibility tools and differentiating for all learners K-12. We have so much access to technology and it's really important that all of our students and teachers know um, it does not have to just be because I'm classified. It could be because I need support in any area. And so really highlighting what these tools um, allow themselves to do. 
We've also held several parent universities this year, which have been great. They've been in person. Um, parents are coming. And so just two that we recently ran, one in September, was just a parent's guide to Google Classroom. Having parents understand what the students need to get started in September, unpacking what a classroom could look like, what's in there, how do they use it, has been really helpful. And last week, we ran one around Google Read and Write, which is an accessibility tool for all students that we have K-12. So parents could really sit down and think about how can they support their learner at home, what does it look like, and how do they access it. Um, so parent universities have been great. Aside from just the universities or the in-service or um, before and after school sessions, we always believe that learning on your own is really important. So we constantly are keeping up with our technology communications. So as a department, we highlight a quarterly bulletins around particular themes every quarter so that teachers and faculty and staff can learn it on their own or delve into a topic that they're interested about. We also do a Tech Tip Tuesday. So every Tuesday, you get from us a little nugget of information that'll just help you in the classroom, help your students, help you with planning or designing. Um, so our Tech Tips have been really um, helpful for our teachers. And all of this is posted in our Google Classroom. With, so with anything that we're publishing, we keep a whole year's deck worth so that teachers can always go back and reference on their own. Everyone's busy, a lot on their plate, but we just want to make sure that information is accessible to them whenever they need it. So with that, you can see just two quick pictures here. Again, I won't uh, go into Rob's presentation, but this is just a picture in the iLab that we were using the Promethean board from one of our in-service classes a few weeks ago on formative assessments, and then the launch of our makerspace. So it's been amazing to have students in this space, teachers in this space, being vulnerable, trying it out, seeing what works, seeing what we need to change and improve. Um, but it's just so nice to actually have um, the boards in the space. And I do have a quote from one of our teachers who asked if I would share this tonight. So I'll read it from her. This is from a fifth grade teacher um, who just received her new board right after February break. We just installed it, right? It feels like much longer than that, but it wasn't. So she said, having a Promethean board in our classroom has transformed instruction um, and student engagement. Its built-in applications allow my students to be creative, experience, and work together in a hands-on learning environment. We love the spinner and the whiteboard application, and I love that now my classroom feels like a whole community where students could engage with one another, solve problems, experiment, and try things again. It's from Ellen Litt in fifth grade. So in addition to our infrastructure, in addition to our instructional component, we also have a data component within the department. So in addition to state reporting and the day-to-day -day scheduling that happens and that takes place, one of the biggest projects that you've heard us talk about a little bit since last year is our data dashboard. But I'm very excited to share that we are like 99.9% .9 done with the dashboard. <laughs> Um, but with that comes that it's not a stagnant dashboard by any means. So we are constantly updating and revising as different assessments and pieces come into play. So what do I mean by that? PowerSchool now has what's called Unified Insights, which is their data dashboard solution. It comprises of academic and non-academic information of a student, so you can really see the whole trajectory of a child that enters in RAI. Um, because of the pandemic over the last few years, some of our assessment data hasn't been there because we haven't had assessments. Um, but we're hoping in the next couple of years, you will see a trajectory of three to five years of assessment data to see how a child is progressing and what's doing. What's great about this is that um, we're working together as an admin team, we had our first training at one of our council meetings, um, and Trisha and I are working on a plan in place to continue to train our principals, our assistant principals, our directors, and then eventually come up with a plan for our teachers. The best part about this is once it's ready, once everyone is trained and you can see the data, you can log in through PowerSchool, which is our student information system. So we're familiar with that aspect of it. It does a nightly refresh, and we don't have to wait till BOCES data comes out later on in the year. Once I get the information, we upload it, and then your trajectory and charts are already there. Um, you can filter down as granular as you want to get. If you want to see all of our ENL students, if you want to see how many students took the you know, three through eight ELA math assessment. It's very, very delineated per student, which has been really helpful for us. So we're excited to, um, you know, continue our learning around that. Every time we give new assessments, like the NWEA, then that, like our winter assessments just went into that system. So it'll constantly be updated. It's not gonna be a stagnant platform. 
In addition to that, we're excited to say, or maybe I'm excited to say, that Final Sight bought out Blackboard. Um, so we will be working on a brand new website that we are hoping to launch um, by next school year, so the 23-24 school year. What we're really excited about Final Sight is just its look and flexibility. Um, so having the ability to be more comprehensive on any mobile device, moving away from an app and just making sure that our website is actually depicted correctly on any device that you're on. Um, it has all the security measures in place that we need for web hosting. Um, it's going to be an all-in-one place communication. So one of the things that we learned from our second revision of our website is images and videos and structure um, really lend people to go to our website. So we're going to move away from some text-based information that we have and really tell our stories through images and videos. Um, it also integrates with PowerSchool, which is an awesome feature for us on the data side, and then always keeping in mind our ADA compliance um, to just make sure that's accessible for anyone that needs it. So making sure all of our images, all of our videos have the proper tags um, that is needed and required for all of that compliance. And I, I just want to comment, Caitlin and her team had been working really hard for months on weeding through everything that's currently on the website, restructuring, reformatting things on the existing website so that when we get to the point that the transition to the final site platform comes, everything's sort of been purged and reorganized on the other end. So I thank you, Caitlin. I know you've been on that for months. You're welcome. <laughs> waiting for it's this a fun to happen. <laughs> Very exciting. Um, in addition to that, so um, again, with the infrastructure, the data, the coaches that we have in place, um, working with our library media and our computer science engineering departments is also a big part of this team um, and the technology committee. So I'll start with that first. This year, our technology committee is um, comprised of teachers. We have some administrators, uh, board of ed members, and we've really been digesting and unpacking the New York State computer science and digital fluency standards. So our goal this year was to really take them apart and understand and what they are, and looking at these four principles of what does it mean with the computer science standards to align that to equity and access, interdisciplinary connections, or relevance and engagement. What we're finding through the committee that's really powerful is a lot of our connections through the work that we've done in engineering 612 over the last two years, changing our coursework, increasing our trajectory and our, our classwork. Um, we're meeting a lot of those standards, which is awesome to say, um, especially with our new cybersecurity class that we have. We're really touching upon these other areas. Um, it also folds very nicely with our science committee that's working right now in terms of elementary STEAM, STEM, and the maker spaces to really see what the standards are and how can we increase those different touch points in those different disciplines. So there's a lot of learning and a lot of excitement around the standards that we're doing as a team. And then in addition to library media, our media specialists have been great. They've been working super hard this year, not only to digest and learn our new spaces and navigating them around their lessons, um, but one of the biggest things that we tasked them this year is to kind of shift their curriculum and think about not only our traditional library lessons, but also how can they in engage in digital citizenship and digital fluency within the curriculum. So we've spent the latter of the end of last year and all of this year really working with um, common sense media is one of the sources that we're using to create a scope and sequence by grade level K-5 of uh, targeting these different areas. So that's been really, um, they've done a great job with it. It's still a work in progress. We'll be revising quite often, um, but it's important for our students to hear this type of language and this vocabulary and learn these lessons when we have all this technology and access in our buildings. And then our next steps. So where are we going after all of this? So some of the biggest things that we are doing as a department for next year, again, going back to the roadmap and touching upon the same areas, is that we continue to still need to do work around our infrastructure and our security. Some of the biggest projects that will take place is upgrading our PA system. Again, we're working on Osborne right now, and we'll be touching the elementary schools um, next year. We'll be cabling the high school and middle school. This will be our last building right now to cable to CAT 6A, which we are very excited about. It's been almost five buildings in a very short time, so this will be some great work. And with that, really thinking strategically and um, importantly about our closets. So if you've been in the high school, middle school, and you're in some of our classrooms, you may nervous to serve a rack. 
um, which is not the best place. But so now this is the time that we are really going to peel back all of the infrastructure, design spaces and closets that make sense for that type of work, get them out of classrooms, no temptations for anyone to touch or look at it when you're in a space. Um, so this will be times that we're gonna do that work and relocate those areas. And then continue to work with our maintenance department and our engineers to install as many Promethean boards as we can across the district for next year. Um, we'll also continue again looking at our mobile devices. We never want anything to get stagnant. Um, so that's on our five year replacement cycle. So continuing some of that work. Um, professional learning around Promethean is something that we are hitting the ground running with. We've already trained several of our middle school teams, high school teams, elementary teachers. This is a big part of our superintendent conference day that's coming up at the end of March. Um, and then also running before and after school sessions for our teachers and then planning for summer. So we want to make sure that teachers are aware of the tools that are coming so that if they are onboarded to get one over the summer, they come in September feeling confident about what's in their spaces. We'll continue to do challenges and learning around maker spaces and then also the active learning spaces which ties into the furniture redesign. So it's so fortunate, I love this work. I'm working with several teams right now in each of the buildings on redesigning spaces and uh, classroom design and so we're gonna con be continuing this all through next year um, with all of our different uh, classrooms K-12. We'll hopefully have some more information on the data dashboard and the website. We'll be launching it next year, so you'll be able to see it. And we welcome feedback, so stay tuned for that. Um, you know, hopefully early fall next year. And then one of our biggest focuses for next year for the technology committee, we'll be looking at some cybersecurity. So the technology department has foregoed some audits in the past, um, and we want to do some professional learning for us as a team to grow in this area. So um, doing a cybersecurity audit will be something that the tech committee focus on, focuses on for the 22-23 uh, school year. Excuse me. And then how do we fund all of this? So. Um, we've been really fortunate with the budget to be able to sustain all the work that we're doing. Some of the big um, adjustments that you will see because there are some shifts in the budget lines. Um, for example, last year we were more heavy in terms of the equipment and now this year it's more durable. So I'm just going to talk th through some of those lines to give you a better understanding. So for our contractual district-wide, you can see that number has increased slightly, um, and that is around the high school, middle school rewiring project that is going to happen. So every year when we plan for different buildings that are gonna be done, as you can imagine, we're taking on two buildings in one summer, and the amount of drops um, that are in every room for cameras, for APs, for desktops is very significant. Um, so that will be something that we undergo this summer so that the entire building is rewired. Um, with our consultants, um, just with the amount of work and tools and access and materials that we have within the district, we do need to increase our FTE from our engineer standpoint, so that has been an, um, an increase and a shift. From our BOCES line, you will see two lines now for BOCES. One is for BOCES in data and one is for software. Um, we've been working really hard as an entire district and even as a department to make sure anything technology and software related comes out of the technology line so we can keep track of everything. One, because we need to know what we're spending money on and two, because of Ed Law 2D and how impactful it is to get proper documentation signature and follow that scope and those rules, it's really helpful when it comes out of one place and one person is purchasing the same. That's been a big shift a few years ago. Um, depending on what building or department was using the software, that's where you would find it in the budget. So we had technology all over the place. And Correct. over the last couple of years have clawed that back and it's all under the same umbrella in Caitlin's department. Yeah, it really helps us streamline, especially with what we're using in the classroom. It's accessible, it's equitable across the three schools. Everyone is using that same uh, program and system. So what we've tried is you'll see on the budget lines, you'll see a district-wide technology purchase, which is strictly the district going with the vendor. And then other, um, the tech BOCES one is particular softwares that we do purchase from BOCES like WinCap and some of the financial pieces um, that go in there. And then our durable materials line, so that is something that has increased in, as well. And some of the items that we'll be purchasing next year, again, like we said, the replacement of certain mobile devices, our Promethean boards will come out of that line, new batteries, equipment for our new IDF closets that we're gonna relocate in the high school. 
also working to upgrade our FM systems. So we did replace Osborne School with our FM systems. Now we're working in Midland School, and it's just really great to have these accessibility tools pre-built in the classrooms. If students come in that need them, or just a teacher that has an accommodation that may need a particular system for projection, we're already set and equipped for them. So that is something that we're doing across the three schools. Um, so we'll be doing a school a year, which comes out of that. Continuing to replenish our Chromebooks, our 3D printers, that's all of the items that come out of that durable line. Caitlin, in terms of the, the Promethean board, so the Promethean boards are replacing the end of life smart boards. Correct. And I remember we put that number together of how many we had in the district to replace when the fund funded the 16 or so earlier this year? Yes, yeah, so we have almost like 500 hundred. boards to yeah. replace. Um, right now with the capital project, we've done several. We have 20 more on the docket that Rob's helping us to install. And then over the summer, we're hoping to do about 50 to 75 as quickly as we can get them. Great. So that's why the professional learning is so heavy right now around this item, so that teachers are very comfortable and familiar with what's going to go in their classrooms. Thank you, Caitlin. That is, uh, that's a lot of wonderful information. Um, I think for, clearly for me, uh, right, the data conversation is great. I think what's m even more exciting than having a dashboard is how integrated data has become in the conversation, in teaching and learning, and that's just part of now how the district is operating. And as you were saying, the, uh, the ability for teachers to have three to five years of data when they're looking at kids and to break it down into different groups is just, it's really going to be fantastic for our administration and our teachers. Um, the other thing that I was really happy to hear about, and I think many times what happens is, you know, schools are notoriously uh, found to be in violation of the idea that you just buy something and you put it in a room and you just walk away from it because it's what everybody's talking about, right? We're just doing, right? And the idea that it is why are we buying it, what is the purpose for doing it, and then working with the staff to help them understand the how and the why is just really, once again, speaks so much to the intentionality about the work of the district and, and the planning and the thoughtfulness by which instruction is being delivered. And it's just great to hear. So those are my comments. I don't know if anyone else. Guys, uh, um, clarification question. First of all, thank you so much. This is so thorough thorough and thoughtful, as you said, Jane. Just can I um, ask, when I look back on our, the slide before our technology budget, and I look back on 1920, 18, 19, 19, 20, the 1.6, and now I look at the proposed budget 3.2, is that, the, the doubling of the budget, is that more of a reflection that we're now categorizing things? I mean, I'm sure the budget has increased, but is it really doubled or is it more that we, as Eric, I think just said that we're now that, that's we're cleaning part this of it, up? But it's also the number, number of devices. We went to the one-to-one -one yep. model in the meanwhile. So, but, but bringing all of the software that was spread out everywhere across the district was a, a big piece of that. But the investment in, in hardware since that time has been enormous. And do um, we c see that continuing or do we get to a I mean, we're, we're always going to be point? on a five-year replacement cycle, right? And so as much as we maybe would like to see that number drop, I think it's really important to think about from a security standpoint, from a robust infrastructure standpoint, if we're expected to do all of these things in the classroom with our teachers and with our students, we need the support to make sure that it all works, right? Keep the lights on, keep everything functioning and running. Um, but I have to say, even with the number looking as increased as it does, it's, it is a thoughtful process. Yeah, I, I would say, uh, you know, with the way things are cost things in, from a technology standpoint, don't typically have the lifespan that they did. Um, you know, used to be that you would get five years out of a mobile device, and it may be a three-year mobile device um, now. And you can do certain things to update them, but... Uh, you know, and the technology changes so rapidly. So just the boards, I feel like we just finished installing smart boards a couple of years ago, and now smart boards are obsolete technology that we're replacing with the Promethean boards. And, you know, it takes so long to go through the process because we can only allocate a certain amount of funding each year 
that that it's probably you know the days of it going back down to where it was I, I just don't think it's a realistic place to be right okay thank you that makes sense mm -hmm. well, and also just one other question or add on to that um, ed law 2d became much more prominent over the last yep. five years yep. too so it, that's I would imagine, I'll ask you, how much of a contributing factor is that to the um, expansion of dollars that have to be committed toward whether it's security or compliance related to that? Right, so definitely when we're looking at softwares, um, that's a huge part of it. We Any vendor that we're working with, we're making sure they're signing our documentation before they even get a purchase order from us. Mm -hmm. um, but then sometimes that does limit you in terms of what vendors you can use or who you can subscribe yeah. to because there are certain companies that just say no thank you. Um, and then they may be cheaper, it may be the same type of tool, but now we're working with someone else that could be a little bit higher, but they're meeting all the security needs. Right. Um, and from that standpoint, from security, knowing our students are safe, our teachers are safe, and we're putting the right step forward for that. It, <clears throat> yeah. 2D has definitely impacted the price point for sure. a right. lot of things. That's, That's what I was 100% thinking. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I just had a question on the uh, <clears throat> the next steps relative to the cybersecurity. Is that tied more to the administration and our financial systems um, at that level, or is it more in classroom? and all the, the mobile devices and all the devices that we have for the students and the teachers. So the committee will be working together to definitely look at like an area of focus for that. Um, how I would imagine is that we're going to look at our infrastructure from that side of it. Um, so some penetration testing, just making sure that uh, you know our content filters are in place, things are secure. Um, I think that's going to be a focus, but we will bring the committee together. We'll have an outside vendor come in, do a risk assessment, see where we are, um, and give us some recommendations. So we'll and, definitely and talk we about it. we have been told that uh, the state will be providing um, more support and resources, whether or not that means anything that will be practical to use or financial support <laughs> for cybersecurity. We've been told that this is coming. I think they may have even mentioned in some of our legislative meetings, Jane. But um, we, we keep hearing that. Uh, hopefully that will be something of, of value to us as well. Yeah, no, I was thinking more because you hear about sometimes the ransom ransomware attacks. Exactly. Yep. Getting, yep. Yeah. That'll be the focus, right? So our engineers are we're constantly talking. We're looking at NIST, which is our new cybersecurity framework that we use. So our standards, basically, of what we have to oblige by. And that's always at the forefront of what we're planning and designing and implementing. Um, so looking at that, doing a risk assessment, see where we land, find that target area, and actually test it. And then come back to say, like, if there are any vulnerabilities, what does that look like? What are some shifts? and professional learning that we can do our end to just get better. Thank you. Everybody else? Okay, so. Thank you, Caitlin. Yes, thank you, Caitlin. That was great. Okay, we will move on now to our athletics presentation. Ms. Dulé. So I feel like this is going to be rather boring compared to what Caitlin just presented. <laughs> um, so we'll we'll start here uh, again with the Rye commitment, as Caitlin mentioned. Um, it's interesting when you think of athletics because athletics happen traditionally after school hours, yet. Athletics are an extension of the classroom, as we all know. Um, our students are a part of this, obviously our coaches, and our full department. So while it's something that we look at on a daily basis, whether it's here in the NPR, whether it's in our classrooms, our students obviously see this a lot, it, I'd like to reflect and think about athletics as a whole while, again, it's after school hours, we're an extension of the classroom. And so this is obviously another piece of our planning as part of budget. So to start off with some goals, facility and planning is continuing, um, continuously happening. Scope and sequence, Rob, uh, Gabby and I, our um, operations committee, if you will, meet uh, bi-weekly or as needed. And so this has been a great committee that we've been able to plan, um, assess some of our for example, in the world of athletics, some of our needs, um, we've been able to evaluate and assess some of our uh, pieces where we want to head uh, in, within our budget and some things that we may need some support with. So this is an ongoing process. It's continuous. Um, and then I'm very thankful, as Caitlin said, to have Rob 
as a part of this team and Gabby to help move and shift. So we're not stagnant, we're not just talking, we're moving forward as we go. Um, and this is something that's important for sustainability and obviously for not just our facilities but for our entire community um, to be a part of. Um, you will hear something in the next year, over the next three years, that something that came from actually our section, and our Inside Out, Inside Out initiative. And there's a focus within this initiative on program and community culture, as well as student culture. Um, within that, there's a third bullet there, our student athletic survey. It's something that we've talked about as a group here when we first started discussing um, diversity equity and inclusion, um, but it's something that recently popped up and uh, interest me, a local colleague um, had used a third party vendor to look at trends within athletics, specifically not just within coaching, but also like some of the things from the data dashboard that I'm interested in is, you know, trends and in, in, uh, related to eligibility and gender and ethnicity, things that we haven't been able to necessarily track before. So some of those pieces will be within that Inside Out initiative. So we're looking at constantly what our culture is, how can we always improve and grow, um, and that's collaborative with our high school and middle school administration as well. Health and safety. Um, Tracy Barnett, uh, our director of health services, has been very helpful, as well as our athletic trainers. This is continuously at the forefront uh, in our planning. And just yesterday, for example, we had our preseason spring coaches meeting. And in that meeting, we were able to deploy um, all of our AEDs to, that Gabby was actually instrumental as well um, in supporting that all of our coaches have a one-on-one -on -one device, so to speak, with our AED, which is huge. This is not the norm, but it's important for us. Um, your student athletes, your community, uh, you will not have to worry when we attend an event at another school district that there's not an AED in sight. So that's huge. Um, that has been a big piece right now that we've been working on. We've also continued to do um, any kind of EpiPen training. Uh, we've done any specific needs to our students to work toward that. Um, any students that have particular needs, Aaron's been been instrumental with that as well. So our health and safety, again, it's something that I just wanted to highlight because it kind of goes without saying that this is what we do, but it's important, especially that AED component, um, just something that's really, I feel very thankful for, and as I said to our coaches, they're very lucky that they have a district that supports this, and I hope we never have to use them. So Susan, sorry, yeah. just before you go on. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it like a... Um, like a portable AED that they can take with them and then they've been trained on it or how does it? Well, yeah. Yep. Nice. Oh, it's what's it called? That's a pelican great. case? I think is what she called it. Yeah. And it's really? bright yellow. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. It's it's about this big um, and, and it goes to and from. And battery operated. Yep. Wow. Yep. That's fantastic. Yep. And 30, so they'll 33 sign new ones, right? Yep. Yeah. And thankfully, I mean, when Tracy ordered them, I think it was a year and a half ago, Gabby, if I'm correct, <laughs> like, I have colleagues that are searching and, and continuously. So there's a plan in place for that as well, too. Uh, they, our coaches sign them out. They have to check them regularly. And Aaron and Gretchen, our wonderful athletic trainers, will remind them. And they actually have to check it off um, on a regular basis. And when they turn them in, um, that everything is in working order. So it also gets our coaches... I think um, used to working with it because it's almost like this box that you don't want to touch because you're afraid the alarms are going to go off. So by checking it, it gets them used to, you know, dealing with it. Again, I hope we never have to use it, but so pretty exciting. Um, again, I wanted to highlight some participation numbers. Our participation numbers, now that this is my third year here at Rye and a two full solid years post um, that thing called COVID, um, we are able to look at our numbers. And again, these are averages, but they're pretty much maintaining. From what I can see in data, even previously that I've, uh, I've looked at, again, this data um, does have 
the spring 2020 where we did not participate and then the fall uh, season one and fall season two in there. So you'll see that these numbers are, are pretty consistent when you look, there are some years when I look at the participation numbers and they're a year apart, or excuse me, a number apart. And this data we actually supply to New York State Public High School Athletic Association every year. Um, it's important that our data is correct too for that reporting because um, all of our fees and things that are associated with our, our school district are associated with that as well. And I'm very fortunate to have an administrative assistant who's wonderful at this and can provide it at, the, at a, a finger snap. Um, again, on expense per pupil, we looked at the average again of our, um, our fall sports, this is for fall, and we look at materials uh, that we utilize within those particular sports, our coaching stipends, our estimated transportation costs, and then come up with a cost per pupil. And again, a lot of our uh, cost per pupil, if, if you didn't have this, there's a lot of perception out there, of course, what we spend our monies on. So I think it's important that we always have this and we always look at that. Um, traditionally, there are particular sports that you obviously have to spend a larger amount of materials on because of health and safety and others that don't require necessarily as much. Uh, some of those numbers are high for numbers or sports where there's lower participants and that's because of rentals. Um, you look at girls swimming and diving, obviously we don't have a pool so it costs money to rent the facility, otherwise that would be much lower. So overall, if you look at the fall, winter, and spring, our costs per pupil are well balanced if you took out some of those big items of rentals, for example. And then we head to winter. You can see very similarly um, the cost per pupil. I will highlight ski because again, remember we started last year at a smaller level, so these numbers are just for two years, not the 2018 to 2023, um, and we continue to grow on that as well. But overall, you can see again, our numbers are there, materials, coaching, and, and an estimated transportation. And here we are with the spring. Again, a breakdown. You can see overall things balance out, and these numbers in some sports will continuously go down in materials as we average over time, where we've had to increase spending here and there for different uh, purchases. Um, athletic facilities I wanted to highlight, and again, this was a, a piece when we first came on, we've replaced, been able to replace 10 of the basketball backboards in the high school gymnasium. This is our, one of our main backboards. Um, if you've uh, been in there, you've seen all of them are replaced, which is great because um, you can put one down, you can put all of them down, you could put two down from separate corners. So this isn't just obviously for athletics, this is our physical education classes, our community lunch. This has been a huge piece. Um, and when I went to Gabby with this, she, you know, we were able to do this as a district over time with the support um, and Rob as well who could see the vision and make it happen um, over time. So this has been very, very helpful and it's helped our custodians as well because on a daily basis, pre these 10 basketball boards, it was the key in taking 10 minutes out of their day to just put down the boards and then come in later and put them back up. And again, they either it was all or none. So that was a little challenging. In the future, as far as projects as part of that scope and sequence, there are larger projects, but these are projects that we as a district are looking at. Um, our wrestling room needs some updating and um, the scoreboard on the main field. Obviously, many of you, we've been in discussions with this, you've seen that the cost to replace the bulbs um, of those boards is a little bit higher, but that may be something we may have to look at depending on where we head um, with the scoreboard in our future. And new sports are, I feel like, you know, I keep saying they're new sports, but Unified is actually new this year. Um, the picture that's here is the first um, subgroup of students that attended a leadership forum in Austin that Special Olympics provided for us. It was open to all schools that are participating in Unified Sports right now. Uh, Aaron and I recently just met. So um, Margot Hackett and Ashley Merritt, our two coaches, uh, met with our partners, which are, are pictured here. There are about 20 more students in addition to these students that are there. Um, 
next steps, Aaron and I will be putting a communication out to our families to work with our uh, students with intellectual disabilities to come up with our athletes, if you will. And so we can have a parent information night or family information day, rather, to explain what Unified is and what it consists of. And after April break, we will begin practices. And we will have six minimum practices before we can participate in a game. And I will be sharing that information as far as our games, et cetera, when they occur, where they'll be. But we will have approximately five games. And uh, we will practice after school and have competitions after school as well. And again, once again, boys volleyball, once um, our, our budget is uh, hopefully approved, we will move forward and posting, uh, looking for our coaching staff for boys volleyball and get started uh, with that. And then in our athletic budget, again, you will see there's not much of a change. It's more shiftings of money. Um, you'll see some increase, for example, in uniforms and supplies because we've added some teams. You will see reconditioning has increased because that's a consistent health and safety component um, related to some of our sports with equipment that needs to obviously be inspected and, and issued appropriately. And the uh, equipment line item that went down, we actually purchased our alternative vehicle, um, our Pol a Polaris vehicle this year. So that's why that was a little higher than in the past, the previous year. So we've balanced out nicely. I will highlight BOCES because that code of BOCES isn't just administrative fees through our section, so to speak. That's officials fees. That's uh, attending meets at the armory. That's weight assessment and wrestling. That's family, I, uh, family ID's registration platform because it's day eight of it's local live, it's many different things that go into that, that line item, if you will. Susan, if I could just ask, yes. so uh, I, we had lots of conversation about football equipment yes. back in the fall. Yep. So um, factories burning down, I'm <laughs> yeah. not sure that was this year, that was two years <laughs> yeah. ago. Where, where do you, Don't say where it do alone. You, I mean, how, how are we preparing sure. for because uh, I know we talked about splitting yep. the equipment, modified having their own yep. equipment. Where, where are we with all that in sure. your budget? For so, as promised, when we were at the end of the season, instead of sending it all at, out together, our vendor, Stadium Systems, actually picked up the modified equipment first and then the high school equipment separate and actually is delivering them back the same way. So our high school equipment will come, actually, actually it's already here um, in, in the field house stored and our modified equipment won't come until June so it'll be completely separate on what we've sent out. In addition to that, that allows us to plan on numbers. So as I've mentioned in the past, helmets shelf life's 10 years old. I know it's been rejected. Um, our budget is ready to go. Riddell, which is our uh, primary helmet vendor that we use, uh, I've already spoken to the vendor them himself uh, recently, and we're prepared to order what we need for next year's budget and have, obviously, the funding to do so. And again, it wasn't the funding previously. It was more of the numbers, so we actually won't run into that this year. But um, the ordering is, you know, being recommended as soon as possible because they are still in that pattern. Just to follow up on that point, Susan, is that one of the, uh, help me make sure I'm, I'm remembering correctly, that sure. one of the concerns as well, or one of the, the difficulties, was that there was an inability to share equipment, but the numbers were reliant upon the enrollment for the JV varsity and then kind of modified yes. that, what was left over. And so have you looked to see kind of what has been the enrollment yep. in those sports and then ordered so that there is enough for yep. standalone yep. for all three sports at those levels? So last year, JV and varsity was the highest that I can foresee over a large period of time. So looking at that number and looking at what modified traditionally has been with two teams, that's the number I'm using because again, you'd rather be high than low. And it's not, if you look at the sustainability of the helmet life, um, you have 10 years with it. So if we have a handful of helmets that we're not utilizing, so be it, they'll be used the following year. Um, and we'll make sure, obviously, they're tagged appropriately. So yes, um, by separating it in general, will help not only support 
the amount of equipment, but also the appropriate equipment. Because when we order, I know I'm very cognizant of ordering the appropriate sizes for our students, um, so there aren't leftovers, so to speak. So this, though, will assure that there's enough of equipment, because this, the varsity helmet is the same as the modified helmet. Is it 10 years of use or 10 years? 10 years. Okay, so even if you buy one and it sits for 10 years, yep. and after 10 years you can't use it? Correct. We haven't had that issue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no? It's a good question. <laughs> no, we It's a good not. question. <laughs> it's a good question for sure. Any other questions? No, I, I think this is a, a great presentation and I find it just as interesting as Dr. Sisson. <laughs> so I think you undersold yourself. <laughs> Jane, do I? Jane can ask one quick question. Sure. Sorry yeah. to jump in. About um, new sports, you mentioned the unified basketball, boys volleyball. Is there a process, do we look at um, enrollment numbers and cuts to teams to look at, have we ever thought about adding like a second JV team or like a freshman football team or a freshman mm -hmm. basketball team? Do we look at that in our process when we're looking at new sports? So yes and no. Um, <laughs> the no pieces, um, obviously at the high school level, for example, there, I, I'm not aware of another school that has another JV team. Uh, a second JV team. There are sometimes a varsity B program or varsity B team. Or just that about squash, because I know like squash, it has the two varsities, right. two JV. So squash is unique because it's not a New York State public high school sport. So while we host it, we are only one of three schools in the section that actually hosts that sport. Um, so that would be something that would definitely um, be a discussion whether we would want to or be able to add that to our budget. Um, most of our other sports, we have, I think all sport, we have every single sport except for um, bowling and fencing right now that I can recall, um, that are New York State public based. The reason why when you say the word freshman team, in my experience, you can add more participation, but you can also create a, a almost, uh, not a self-fulfilling prophecy, but a backup where you're just continuing to support and add programs and teams where ultimately it's, it's maybe not conducive to the future of that program, but also do we have the space? Like right now, some of our programs adding a freshman team or even one more team, we would not be able to accommodate. Boys volleyball works great, as you know, because uh, it pairs up nicely with our girls volleyball program, just like girls and boys basketball. So yeah, so boys volleyball actually came from participation and advocacy of those students during community lunch, during physical education. So those are the voices that we're hearing. So if, if we felt we needed to increase, it'd be definitely a conversation with, do we want to keep adding? Yeah, and can we, can we support system. it? We yeah. have the infrastructure to support Correct. additional Correct, that's, that's mainly the piece too. Well, and I would imagine too, it, it, would, it would play a role if there's any competition, like teams for them to play. Correct. Um, within the section, correct. At other, at other like schools. freshman football, I, uh, is the f football chair, and 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 I've had freshman football before. There are probably at this time four teams in the entire section with freshman football, and they can't find games. So traditionally, those teams have folded, and they've just maintained the JV. So it just depends on that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are just many layers to it for sure, and and can we sustain it? Good question. Okay, thank you. And then, so what about um, the opportunity for expanding the unified sport program beyond just basketball? Yep. Is that an option? Sure. Um, the only other sport right now that's being offered in our area is bowling. That's going on right now. So most schools that have started this have started with basketball and then have rolled into bowling. Like I'm going to use Henrik Hudson as one of them because Tommy Baker is actually our chairperson for Unified. Um, he's the athletic administrator there. Um, they started with basketball and slowly moved into bowling and bowling is taking place right now. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Oh, thanks. Thank right. you. Thanks, Wonderful. everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Susan. And last but certainly not least, our facilities presentation. It's Tricky Bangliano.
Thank you for the opportunity to allow me to uh, present the facilities budget. The facilities budget is where the, uh, the, the lights are kept on, uh, not just figuratively. <laughs> Literally, we pay the light bill. Um, <laughs> but in addition to that, there's uh, all the, the health and safety and maintenance of the building that, that happens on a daily basis. Um, I'm proud to be part of the team that, uh, that, that creates that safe environment. We hear a lot about the learning environment, but the physical plant is critical to, to providing a conducive learning environment. <laughs> It, having the lights on in the classroom is good for learning? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was a terrible test taker, so the lights off probably would have been better. I just guess C all the way down. Um, again, to, re to reiterate the importance of that physical plant, it, it's how we deliver the commitment to our students and staff. Um, in addition, in, there's one statement in particular that stands out for me, and that's the commitment to the community, and that's the, to continually strive to improve. And there, is, there has been some significant change that we've been working on, uh, particularly with our maintenance department. And, and a slow expansion of that, which I'll get into uh, shortly. So here are some uh, highlights in the facility budget. Uh, anyone who's opened up a utility bill at, at, um, at home can certainly attest to the, the significant increases in utility costs. So we track um, all our utility costs, and I wanted to, to really look very closely and analyze it and, and budget accurately for utility costs because there's a lot of percentages going around. People are, you know, we, we know they're, they're going up, but we went back as, uh, as many years as, as the, um, at, um, that I was able to access the bills, and I think we went back to 2015. So here's a snapshot of two budget years, but uh, in addition to budgeting accurately for this coming year um, and capturing the actual market conditions, it this is a tool that we use for other uh, other purposes. So I'm able to, we separate it by location, but we're able to look at snapshots of different months and see if there's any, any spikes amongst buildings um, year to year, or perhaps just um, um, amongst our different elementary schools in a, in a current month and, and see if there's some kind of spike to, to look at uh, some potential savings or perhaps there's some runaway equipment or there's some kind of failure with our, with our management system. So it's a, it's a multi-purpose tool. Um, but again, for this purpose, it's critical for accurate budgeting. The picture you see on the bottom there is an army of equipment on some of our breaks, and certainly over the summer we, we take all this equipment out. It um, there's been past uh, there's been past investment in this equipment, but if you don't maintain your equipment, uh, you're 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 doing it in injustice. Just like not changing oil on your on your car, and eventually it's gonna it, it's gonna deteriorate. So um, again, accurately budgeting for, for that preventive maintenance for the equipment, as well as all the custodial supplies and the cleaning supplies, which have been impacted greatly by inflation. And the same spreadsheets that you see here for tracking the utilities we do for all of our supplies that we purchase and making sure that we, um, A, we're, we're, we're buying efficiently, but we're also budgeting uh, accurately. So the budget also includes uh, some cheat, uh, some tree care program, um, which is for the, self, the safety and the health of trees. We have an arborist that goes around on a yearly basis and analyzes everything, makes suggestions for uh, for disease control as well as, as as safety. If there's any limbs that per, that pose a danger, uh, we we look to address it on a on a on a priority basis. Those costs have also uh, seen some some increases, and uh, and based on those yearly assessments, we're we're looking to do a robust um, uh, a, a robust care of our trees, and and that's being budgeted for appropriately. I would also like to add regarding trees. There's also you know, we're budgeting for the for the the care of the the stand of trees that we have, um, but there's also eager community members that approach us all the time. And I've been working on a project uh, analyzing all our property and seeing if there's potential for some tree planting, which helps with flood mitigation. And um, there's there's actually a very eager uh, student group that I met with recently. Uh, it was a civics class, and <clears throat> they they also have the same desire that we have to, to maintain our trees. And I, I met with them, and, and um, I'm able to 
part with them, partner with them, if you will, and they're assisting with some of this uh, district-wide assessment and see where they could, um, wait, where their efforts can be um, directed to actually assist the district and, and hopefully have a long-term plan that, that helps uh, with flood mitigation and, and uh, the other benefits of, of having a healthy um, tree canopy. Again, some, some more highlights from the facility department. I mentioned the maintenance department as their commitment to continually uh, improve. Uh, here's, here's a few pictures. This is one of the first projects that we, uh, that we, um, we were able to utilize the, the, the crew. And there's a mural that you could see. It's in the, in the connecting corridor between the science wing and uh, the main gym of the high school. It was, uh, it was a mural um, on a... Uh, that, that was painted by students uh, with the guidance of, um, I know I, work, I worked with the special ed department and when we, uh, we got this, um, we turned this project into uh, a reality here. And we were able to do it all in the house. So there was one day I actually put my tool belt on, I worked with the guys, so that was, uh, that was um, uh, refreshing. And we were able to, to get this panel up in pretty short order and, uh, and we look forward to, to being, being able to do more of those type of projects in-house uh, so we could, we could react very quickly and um, we have um, a lot of skill and tools and it's just directing it to, uh, to the district's benefit. So as part of a maintenance staff, having them well trained and having, uh, you know, learning new skills at, that, that are needed al along with some of this new equipment that comes in, that, that's, uh, that's also being budgeted for in the coming, um, in the coming budget. So where uh, examples of some of that training, there's one staff member starting at the, um, uh, he's, gonna, he's going to be going to a BOCES HVAC training program um, to learn some of the basics. It's a three-part program and he's going on his own time at night and, and, um, and it's a skill that we're, we're supporting and, and we're lucky to have um, his eagerness to, to actually to go on his own time and start learning that. So one of the, um, some other uh, safety training are like vertical man lift uh, training that it's an OSHA certified um, course that you have to take for some of our equipment. Um, I'm probably gonna be taking that one too. Um, you get to wear the harness and, and it's almost like retaking your road test but on a, on a, on a lift. So um, you're welcome to join Jane. I see your, I could, <laughs> you see you're containing your excitement. Uh, <laughs> Overruled. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm not real used. Wow. Once again, Dr. No Fun reporting for business. But, but um, getting, getting back to, the, to this maintenance crew and, and the, um, the opportunities that arise, I, I know uh, both Caitlin and Susan have, have mentioned the facilities department and partnering together and, and work in constant contact and coordination. And I do feel that we have a very supporting role to, to, to get projects that are all student and staff based. And, and that's, um, I, that's why I do believe that the facilities is mentioned uh, pretty often. And uh, there's one small example of a, a board that is the pre-installation um, but we're looking very comprehensively at a project like this. So there's obsolete equipment, there's old conduit, there's uh, perhaps a placement is not ideal. So we're, we're looking at a project like this and taking it um, ta and, and looking to, to clean it up and bring it to the current standard and hopefully we won't have to touch it for many years uh, to come. So. Even a small project like that is probably four or five trades. There's, there's running the data, there's moving the electric, there's the painting, there's the physical mounting of it, there's moving some of the FM systems, um, perhaps adjusting some of the lighting, and to be able to have um, to the, the, the array of skill within a few members of our maintenance crew and getting it completed is actually very satisfying, not just for me, but even, even the crew members. I could see that it's an inspiring pride in them and, that, um, and I think that's all, that's all um, uh, related to the, to the, the support that, that our department gets, so it's well appreciated. So the 
transfer to uh, capital amount. I have to say that Gabby assisted with the with the verbiage on the bottom. Uh, so it's funding allocated in the general fund as part of the annual budget, and it's transferred to the capital fund, and it all goes to to projects that we've been discussing, identifying, and uh, for those on the facility subcommittee, where um, we have uh, potential projects. Um, that we're constantly evaluating, and um, the this funding is one source to pick off some of these projects. How how we select them at the time? There's there's a lot of factors. Obviously, we prioritize we prioritize need. There are some health and safety issues, uh, but sometimes it's something that's very easily achievable because the material is available, the space is accessible, and and it's. Um, and it's a project we could complete. If anyone's been through Milton um, recently, we've done uh, a number of floor replacement, and that that's going to be a tremendous help in the summer. It's a reduction of chemical um, chemical stripper and waxing because it's we've moved away from that with our new floor selection. So although there might be other items that would appear on the list that. Um, might need attention, they might not be achievable. They might require more planning uh, or permitting and, and it's it's just a way to just continually improve with the resource we, we have available at the moment. So here are all the line items. Um, some of them I've discussed, uh, the, particularly with the utilities. There's one I, I do want to point out uh, it's uh, it's an architectural line, and this architectural line has it's not just for architects, but it's uh, architects, engineers, a lot of the professional services that are required when you have a project there to a identify it and then be implemented. So um, as we as we uh, approach the tail end of the capital project, which has certainly covered a lot of improvement. Um, there's always need uh, in, in when you have a half a million square feet of, of you know, district property. So it's constantly evaluating and things deteriorate. And um, that that is an example of, um, of it will fulfill some of the need for some of the, the scope and sequence that Susan mentioned in athletics and, and some of the other improvements that uh, need to happen or just repair. So um, that, that's, <clears throat> that gives us that flexibility and the ability to kind of to, to have a little forethought. So. And Rob, I would say, so the architectural was a big chunk of the increase, but much of it is in utility costs, correct, and energy costs? Absolutely, and that and that's why it goes back to the first slide. What you said earlier, yeah. I wanted to make sure the request was was well justified and and uh, supported in in market conditions. Great. Um, I think you you skimmed over something that I think is extremely important, and I want to go back to for a moment, and that's that you were meeting with our students. And I say that because I've been in a lot of districts, and I don't think I've ever been in a district where the chair, uh, the department head of facilities, had an opportunity to meet with students in a way that was focused on something so important to the students and so important to the, the thinking and the development of the district. And to you, it may have just been you know, part of your day, but that's a really amazing thing. And I thank you so much for doing that. And I think it speaks volumes to your level of commitment, not just to the physical structures, but to the kids who occupy the seats. Thank you. Well, I, I can't take any credit away from the students. The, the amount of energy they have is incredible. Um, so they, they, they did a bunch of research and they presented, presented it to me and, and uh, they wanted to do some planting along the brook. And I was fortunate enough to say, um, that's a great idea. Um, but what we also have is this much larger project that, that you could not only be a part of, but you could actually, you could assist in actually um, contributing to. Uh, and they were eager to do it, so it was. Uh, I, I give a lot of credit to the students. So, but thank you. 
I give a lot of credit to you. Thank you. Equally as much. Are there other questions or highlights? Um, I think I just wanted to, um, first of all, thank you and thank all, all everyone for all the great presentations tonight. I did just want to um, point out, I think it's a, a, a really um, wonderful shift to see the ability to um, have so much uh, skill in-house when it comes to our, um, our maintenance uh, staff uh, and not have to outsource as much. And I know that's been a, a long-term, <laughs> <laughs> a long-term goal um, for us, but even the the description that you had about um, you know the installation of the board, like you have all these individuals who have a, have different skill sets, but you you know in the past would have had to have outsourced that to however many numbers of people um, when you didn't have those those skills and and the commitment to the professional learning. To have them continue to build those, so um, you know, I, I just think that's a fantastic. It kind of, it it really aligns with everything we're doing from a professional learning standpoint across the board. It hits every single um, part of the the district. So I, I I wanted to point that out, and I wanted to thank you for continuing that work, um, and and to the to the maintenance crew for you know jumping in and, and taking part. I'll certainly share share that with them. They'll appreciate it. So I mentioned multiple trades. There's only three people, but I think I mentioned about six or seven trades. So, um, yeah. So that they're, I, I'm I'm lucky so far. Yeah. And the reality is, the install wouldn't have looked that good if we had to outsource it because right. we wouldn't have had the time or the resources to hire the multiple trades that we would have needed to clean up that wall from end to end and the care that it took to put it back together. So it, it's just completely changed how we're gonna be doing things going forward. Well, yeah. yeah. Our, our, staff, our staff cares about Yeah, that's what I was just gonna say. They, you know, we, we've heard, I mean, Chris has told times. the story yeah. over the yeah. years <laughs> of the custodians, you know, being commented in the uh, facility surveys and and that is so true they really care about mm -hmm. this place and it shows in their work well and I think the idea that a uh, school district is a learning institution and the idea that learning and professional development is not just for the academics uh, anybody who's ever worked in a building will tell you if you want to get something done you become best friends with the head custodian <laughs> they're gonna get you exactly what you need and when you need it and that's not by happenstance and having you know people so dedicated it does make a difference that mural looks different because the people who created it care about this school in a way that no one else from the outside could and we're extremely fortunate to have that um, I do just want to say one kind of overarching theme, if I may, um, about all of the presentations that we've had the opportunity to hear over the last two weeks. There is a consistent uh, theme between and among all of them, and that is collaboration. There was not one presentation by one department that didn't talk about three, four, five other departments. And that is not by accident. That is intentionality, that is professionalism, that is more so than anything dedication to our community and to our students. And it is not something that happens everywhere. It, uh, as a matter of fact, happens very infrequently. And so I want to say thank you to all of our administrators because we are extremely fortunate that our students are in the hands of people who are working committed to their best interest every day of the week. And we thank you. Thank you. Anybody? Thanks. No. I think you said, it, the, I think you said you, it very well. Yeah. <laughs> okay then, we're going to move on. Uh, but before we get too far from budget, I will just say, please, if you want to learn more, next Saturday, March 18th, 9.30 a.m. in this very room, everybody will be here and you can ask all the wonderful questions that you want and get such great insight and information into the district's and budget. You can see the mural firsthand. We'll oh, will we have mural tours? Rob loves doing tours, so. Uh, He's good at it. Yes. He's good at it. He, so. is, he is an expert tour guide. Yes. Yes, he's great at it. But no boiler room tours this year, please. 
everything above grant. <laughs> All right. Uh, so now it is time for the hearing of the public on non-agenda items. We welcome and encourage our community members to address the board at this time. Please come to the podium, state your name, address, and if you are representing an organization. To ensure everyone has the opportunity to speak, please limit your remarks to three minutes. The board is here to listen. The public comment period is not designed to be a discussion. So please understand that we may not respond publicly to your comments or questions at this time. We take your comments seriously and may need more time to process and research an issue. We will ensure questions will be addressed by the appropriate staff member or possibly answer, answered at a future board meeting. We will not entertain comments regarding individual students or district personnel as these are protected under state and federal privacy laws. Please know that we take personnel concerns very seriously. On these matters, we would ask you to follow the appropriate administrative channels. As a reminder, the community may submit written comments at any time to the board by sending those to rcsdboard at riseschools.org. Seeing no members of the community here tonight, we will move on to our consent agenda. Can I please have a motion to accept the consent agenda? Chris Repetto, seconded by Vivek Kameth. Uh, let's take a look at our consent agenda. General, any questions? Fiscal construction. Fiscal. I did just want to ask a question about Vision Hotels. The name seems, I know it is not, well, it is about approving the hotel. There is more to the story. Perhaps somebody could just let us know what that story is. Just the, why we're oh, the, approving a contract with a hotel. Oh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's for the ASL yes. uh, trip to university, yep. and it's the, the lodging for the trip. So, yes. It just seems, I just wanted to, in case anybody looked quickly, it just seems a little odd and you've got to dig and, okay, never mind. Professional appointments. Classified appointments. Special education. Okay, let, can I have a vote please to approve the consent agenda? All those in favor? That would be seven nothing. On this evening's consent agenda, we have our continued training of our teachers in the science of reading. Um, and this continues to show the district's commitment to our students and our teachers in the science of reading. And so we are grateful for that commitment to proceed. Uh, the Milton PTO is donating, sorry, uh, $5,000 for the fifth grade play, which is always a great community building event for our fifth graders, and we look forward to their experience. And we know that Midland is currently, and I believe Osborne as well, right, are both in the throes of their fifth grade play, so we wish all of our fifth grade uh, performers the best of luck. The Rye High School PTO has donated $3,000 for table tennis uh, for community lunch and for, once again, building that community in our schools. And so we thank our PTO for supporting us in that. The Rye High School Girls Lacrosse has donated $3,390 for sideline jackets. I, for one, am always surprised to see that spring sports start when there's still snow on the ground, so I can appreciate the need for being warm on the sidelines, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, we have a facilities agreement on our agenda as well with the Rye Golf, and I think it's a wonderful opportunity to see a city and school partnership to support our athletics department and our athlete our golf athletes. Uh, we have our cooperative bid agreement with Southwest BOCES, and this is for next school year, correct? And it's just another way of highlighting the district's uh, intentionality about trying to be thoughtful about how we spend money and finding ways to save both time and money, which are of huge benefits to the community and our students. And in addition, we have a retirement this evening for Loretta Calandruccio. Did I say it right? I'm sorry, Loretta. I'm working on it. Calandruccio. Here we go. So 
It is with sadness that I announce the retirement of longtime Midland School ENL teacher and district ELL coordinator at the end of the school year. Ms. Calandruccio has been with the district for 29 years, having joined the Rye City School District in 1994 as an ESL teacher at the Rye Middle and Midland Schools. Over the years, Mrs. Ms. Calandruccio was an ESL and then an ELL teacher at Rye Middle School and Midland and Milton Schools. The majority of her career was spent at Midland School. For the past 19 years, she has been the district ENL coordinator for grades K to 12. As part of her duties as coordinator, she wrote the Title III LEP and immigrant grants, which enabled her to create special summer programs for our students and parents. Before coming to Rye, Mrs. Calandruccio was an ESL teacher at Blindbrook Middle and High School, where she also conducted her student teaching. She began her career in education as a computer lab instructor at the Harrison Ave Avenue School and later as a substitute teacher in the Rye, Rye Neck, and Harrison School Districts. Before becoming an educator, Ms. Calandruccio spent five years as a territory manager for Johnson & Johnson. Ms. Calandruccio has a BS from Penn State and an MPS from Manhattanville College. Midland School Principal Jim Boylan said of her, Loretta Calandruccio has had a tremendous positive influence on the students and staff that have had the good fortune to work with her. She always puts the needs of her students and their families first. Her students' successes and accomplishments illustrate Loretta's devotion to teaching as well as her dedication as the ENL department coordinator for the past several years. Her can-do attitude and positive spirit have served the families of the Rice City School District well for the past 29 years. We wish her all the best in the next chapter of her life. She will be dearly missed at Midland. In her retirement letter, Ms. Calandruccio said, it has been a privilege for me to teach in Rye for the past 29 years. I have truly enjoyed teaching English to so many wonderful children and getting to know their families. I have been fortunate to work with wonderful administrators who have provided me with the support, guidance, and encouragement to grow as a teacher. I will miss teaching my students, but look forward to traveling and spending more time with my grandchildren. We miss Calandruccio all the very best in her retirement. And now moving on to presentation and discussion number two, Ms. Boyle, policy. Okay, so we have two policies um, which are up for their second reading uh, this evening. We looked at them uh, for the first time in our previous meeting. Um, the first one is a change, an update to our uh, code of conduct, which is Policy number 5300, this, the Code of Conduct is a very large document, but this particular change is on page 11. And it is a change that reflects an update in New York State law um, regor regarding the development of written protocols to specify notification around any incident re related to um, corporal punishment, which in essence is forbidden. However, if there is anything that um, happens that uh, would fall under this, we would need to ha follow a certain procedure to, of notification, and that's what this update provides. So, any additional questions? I didn't get any additional questions from the last meeting, so just wanted to make sure there wasn't anything further. <coughs> okay. And then we have policy number 9645, which is disclosure of wrongful conduct. Um, and again, this is um, an update based on uh, um, <clears throat> Civil Service Law 75B, um, which uh, includes an update to, to say that if a employee um, finds that there's anything they want to report related to wrongful conduct, it is not required that they go to their employer. This now, um, this update now shows that they can go to a higher authority like the State Education Department or um, something like that. So there, prior to that, this was not uh, part of the policy. Um, and it also has a specific section that talks about reporting for um, anything related to state testing misconduct. There's also an addition in here related to that. So we did have one typo on this during our last meeting, which has been updated. Um, any other questions? 
No? Okay. So then these will go on to our next board agenda for um, adoption and update into our policy manual. And that is it. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, moving on to communications to and from the board. Uh, since our last meeting, there was a February 15th curriculum council meeting. Do we have any board members who are able to give us a report out from the meeting? I was not able to attend that meeting, unfortunately. Okay, Mr. Repetto, duly noted. Guess. Okay, and coming up, we have a facilities meeting, a policy meeting, and a technology meeting. And I did just want to ask, um, as we are tonight circling back to some topics from earlier days, we talked about the helmets. The next one would be regarding a lighting policy. I know that was something that was brought to us before and just wondering if there was an opportunity for us to be seeing that now as the seasons are changing. Yep, um, so we were able to sit down and have a meeting with some additional community members about the updates that we are looking at for the um, for the policy and that is being updated as we speak. It will then um, go through the normal process and channels of going back to the policy committee and then we'll come at that point to the board table for everyone to review um, the updates that have been made to but it. A huge thank you to the community members yes. that joined us um, at CAB a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. it, we got some great history and helpful information as we were working on the revisions to the policy and, right. and they took time out of their days and lives to join us and it was very helpful. Mm -hmm. I, I do have one. I, I did receive an email um, a bit earlier today. Davidson Gordon, who was on the board in the, the late 80s and early 90s, um, was just transferred to hospice care at um, Greenwich Hospital. So uh, I think on behalf of all of the, the members of the school district, we wish the Gordon family all the best and uh, thank Davidson for serving this mm -hmm. community and I wanted to share that with the board. I, I learned that a little while ago. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, any other to and from? No, seeing none. Okay. Back into it. Yes, yes, we will. <laughs> We will be moving back into executive session, so we will not be voting to end the meeting at this time. But prior to that, I will just remind everyone yet again that March 18th, it's a Saturday, 9.30 a.m. here in this very room. Please join us for a community budget conversation. And if you're not able to do that, perhaps you could join us on March 21st for our next board meeting at which we will have our budget adoption. Thank you all, and have a good night. Oh, yeah, okay. So, can we have a motion, please, to go into executive session? Chris Repetto, seconded by Vivek Kameth. Thank you. Do we need to come back down to adjourn the public? I will open the door and adjourn the public. Just, just ask. Yep. Sarah. Correct. Yep, we're all done. I thought I did. Do you want me to say it? I can say it. That's okay. As we are adjourning into executive session, we will not be coming back out to the public for this evening, so we will adjourn from executive session. Have a good evening.